The first Yakuza title was one man's journey to regain lost innocence, to protect the ones he loves and survive his climb out of the underworld. Kiryu throws himself back into the dealings of the Yakuza to save Yumi, only to have her and many others sacrifice their lives for his and Haruka's safety. With the dust beginning to settle a year later and Haruka becoming old enough to take care of herself, Kiryu's mind is left unoccupied. His thoughts are of his past, of what's left for him, and he wonders, why me? Yakuza 1 gave Kiryu his life back, but Yakuza 2 forces the Dragon of Dojima to do something he's never had to, define himself and overcome the guilt that haunts him. I'm GC, and this is Questrospective. Sega was cautiously optimistic of the original Yakuza. It was an experimental title given that there were little to no games on the market depicting modern Japanese culture at the time, and public outcry against Grand Theft Auto just a few years prior marked Yakuza for potential backlash given its violent nature. Sega's splash screen in Yakuza 1 is kind of funny in this context. It's this awkward sounding series of text trying to appeal to a broad audience. What do you want? Dream? Nevertheless, the game sold exceptionally well against expectations and instantly became worthy of a sequel. Toshihiro Nagoshi wasted no time on beginning development of said sequel, slated for release exactly a year after Yakuza 1 was released for the PS2. There was little to no time for press releases or interviews in an era where this kind of horrible business practice was acceptable, and that's because I couldn't find any. And as we all know, if I didn't know about it, then it isn't real. A retrospective interview with Nagoshi, a Nagoshi spective, if you will, revealed the creator's two priorities: finishing the game in a year and a focus on content. Surprising everyone besides the overworked, bedridden souls of Sega staff members working on the project, Yakuza 2 met its release date goal of December 7th, 2006. And by comparison, Sega was feeling much more confident in its sophomoric franchise. Our story begins in the funky 80s, as a lone detective sneaks into a building and witnesses a massacre starring a familiar face. We return to present day at Kiryu's bedside. Horrible memories of last year's events plague him in his sleep, ripping himself out of the nightmares he sits up in a panicked state as Haruka walks into the room. Kneeling in front of the graves of the people who died so that he may live, Kiryu shows signs of survivor's guilt, doubting his own existence. Despite this, Kiryu shows a willingness to put the past behind him until their visit is interrupted by an old friend. Tarada, Fuma's right-hand man and now chairman of the Tojo clan, asks Kiryu for help. Tarada reveals that the Tojo clan is in shambles because of what happened last year, and an uneasy feeling begins to fill Kiryu with dread. As if signaling the start of Kiryu's existential descent, they are ambushed by the Omi gang, and in the midst of the chaos, Tarada saves Kiryu's life by taking a bullet for him. He leaves Kiryu his dying wish, and hands him a blood-soaked missive from his coat, a treaty between the Tojo and the Omi. Owing Tarada his life twice now, and feeling responsible for the state of the Tojo, Kiryu goes on a mission to see the truce happen, even if it kills him. This treaty covered in blood is a great symbol of the state of Kiryu's mind, the blood on Kiryu's hands that prevent him from being at peace. 
He's haunted by his past, visited by a ghost of his past, and is being pulled back into the past through his guilt and sense of responsibility. His promise to Fuma, to Tarada, and to the interim chairman Yayoi Dojima are not only attempts to do what's right, they're a means for Kiryu to avoid facing his demons. And that's exactly what Kiryu does. His intent to get the peace treaty signed is his attempt to find peace of mind. And to do it, he gets away from the place that houses his darkest memories. He leaves Kamurocho behind and journeys to Osaka. Yakuza 2 started players off in a closed-off portion of Sotenbori, a city modeled after Osaka's Dotonbori district, an entertainment district similar to Kabukicho and popular tourist trap. Kamurocho was designed to facilitate players familiarizing themselves with its winding streets, but the team behind Yakuza 2 wanted to ease newer players into the motions of navigating a dense sandbox. Salt and Bodhi slowly became more accessible as you advanced through the game and were more comfortable with the space you were in. It was segmented by a river and only consisted of two main streets, making it far less complex than Kamurocho. Even still, Osaka was its own location with its own set of side quests, its own collectibles, activities, and fun NPCs to run into. Keeping track of two different sets of information for two different areas you'd be jumping back and forth from would have been overkill, so Yakuza 2 added a completion tracker that covered coin locker keys, side quests, places you've eaten at, heat moves you've performed, and a lot more. The tracker cut back on the fruitless walking players had been doing in Yakuza 1. Nothing exasperates a player more than walking across a map for information that could have easily been provided to them in the pause menu, or finally getting somewhere they end up not having to be. If players got lost or forgot about what they were doing, all they'd have to do is stand still for a while until Kiryu had a smoke and recounted to himself what he was up to. The freezing as you moved from one area to the next was still there, but remained the only lingering issue in a vast array of improvements that Yakuza 2's exploration and world design possessed. Returning to Kamurocho if you've played Yakuza 1 was kind of amazing. Old areas had been repurposed by familiar characters, new businesses opened up, and other areas were now under construction. There was a wonderful continuity in returning to the city you had spent so much time in. Yakuza 2 begins the series' attempt to make Kamurocho feel organic. It grows and changes, and in turn you get to see how that growth affects the people living in it. Returning players realize that if Kamurocho was going to grow with every entry, they would be growing alongside it. It was an urban sprawl with lots of twists and turns, but not much to find in them save a few coin locker keys in the oddly placed side quest. It often felt a bit empty with long walks across town lacking much of anything to distract yourself with. They couldn't scale this environment down without making it look like a step backward or disappointing returning players. The only direction was forward, and the only way to avoid making Camarocho feel like the same old city was to fill in those gray blocks with yellows, pinks, and blues. Side content in Yakuza 2 was doubled from the amount in 1, using entirely new buildings devoted to specific games and smart recycling of old spaces. The club Sega's now sported Y76, a first-person sword fighting game with a built-in practice and tournament mode of considerable challenge. More UFO catchers with varying prizes were added to each of the club Sega's, giving players more items to collect and increasing the challenge of obtaining a specific prize. To complement the batting minigame, which focused on reaction time, golfing ranges were added as a slower minigame centered around accuracy and assessing course conditions. Bowling was also introduced as a comfortable middle ground between the two, combining elements from both with 3 or 10 frame rounds and the option to invite other characters to play with you. The underground tournaments from the first game made a comeback with a wider variety of tourney rules and a roster of different fighters that could appear in them. Rotating participants meant replaying tournaments to add them to your defeated opponents list, which unlocked more tournaments to play in and useful prize items. The normal slot reels were replaced by patchy slot machines and they're confusing as hell. I don't understand them at all, it's impossible to win any- Yeah! Did you think it would end with Dragon Quest? Did you think you could stop the champion? These new options worked in tandem with the expansion of their existing counterparts to catch the interest of a wider range of players. They were also placed far apart from each other to give different sectors of Kamurocho and Sotenbori something to do inside of them. This improved navigation since the new buildings for golf and bowling became new landmarks for players to anchor themselves with, 
and created stops for players to take a break from walking from one place to the other without pause. But nothing was as in-depth as Yakuza 2's introduction of Shogi and Mahjong, future staples of the Yakuza series and confusing headaches if you've never played them before. Both Shogi and Mahjong were fully implemented. Shogi had its own ranking system you could work your way up through by playing against succeedingly stronger opponents, earning prizes as you went from 9th Q to Shogi Lord. Mahjong tables represented different difficulty options. The rule sets were customizable to allow you to play the specific kind of Mahjong you wanted to, and a point system kept track of your winnings that you spent on items that sold for a nice profit. You could do so many things in Yakuza 2. Or you could play Mahjong for 20 hours. You could do nothing but play Mahjong. I, I played a, a lot of Mahjong. I have an app on my phone to play Mahjong now. I, I downloaded an extension for my browser that translates online Mahjong games for me. Mahjong 2. But in the name of progress, you eventually had to tear yourself away from the tiles and continue your adventure. Eventually, Kiryu's demons follow him from Kamurocho his greatest fear, staring him down and shaking away whatever normalcy he had obtained. Kiryu found himself face to face with the dragon. On his free night to get acquainted with Sultan Bori, Kiryu winds up in the VIP section of a cabaret club and runs into Ryuji Goda, the dragon of Kansai and son of the head of the Omi clan. Their exchange is tense and full of doublespeak, but it's here we learn how Kiryu views the dragon, the identity he wore for so long until a year ago. <laughs> My name is Jeff. Kiryu's visit to the Omi in order to reach a truce between them and the Tojo the next day is also interrupted by Ryuji. Staging a coup d'etat with the younger members of the clan, Ryuji takes his father hostage, preventing the truce and setting his sights on beating Kiryu in a one-to-one -one fight to decide who the real dragon is. This shared namesake has Kiryu using Ryuji as a mirror into his perception of the dragon. A tyrant, an individual out for blood, and a disruption of peace. The source of Kiryu's problems isn't Ryuji, but the dragon, a part of himself Kiryu is trying to suppress. He blames the dragon within him for the events of the past. Kiryu is stopped by the Yakuza hunter, Kaoru Sayama, after managing to escape the Omi headquarters. She's introduced as a certified badass, and her first course of action after being put in charge of a case revolving around the Omi Yakuza is to send a swarm of police officers into the building during the coup. Then she does something no one else has ever done, and that's place Kiryu under her custody. Hey, look at me. Bitch. Sayama is established to be the sort of person that sets wrongs right without putting others in danger. She is everything Kiryu wants to be and partly already is. Unfortunately, in the context of the narrative, Sayama is also a symbol of Kiryu's desires and his struggle with settling the past. Not exclusively romantic desire, but I'm still not a fan of it. Sayama progressively becomes more fragile as the narrative moves along, and there was no need to do that to the character, even if she were to remain a symbol of desire. In their escape of Omi headquarters, Sayama is shot by an unknown sniper, leaving Kiryu to fend for the both of them. Kiryu's journey to the Omi headquarters is a self-reflection that ends somewhat poorly. His attempt at making peace with himself is interrupted by his guilt and violent past. Kiryu's desire of a better life then arrives to protect him from succumbing to that guilt. She puts a full stop to the escalating situation. This is Kiryu's self-defense mechanism. It's a fight or flight situation and he is flighting. He's so panicked he's punching chandeliers to deal with the stress. My poor son, I will help you, do not worry. But even if you can stop yourself from going down the guilt rabbit hole, that sort of trauma can weaken your resolve and wound your confidence to truly work past it. Kiryu takes Sayama to his safe haven and most treasured place, Serena, the bar from the first Yakuza. Much like Kiryu's sense of self, Serena has been emptied out. It's been stripped of all personality, hollow. But he kicks open the door, helping Sayama inside, pulling down the walls, letting someone in, and allowing himself to be vulnerable. By now you've noticed that Yakuza 2's subtext is a lot stronger than its predecessor. This is most likely due to Nagoshi's focus on content and Hase Seishu not totally phoning it in. I know that's incredibly assumptuous, but hear me out. 
Yakuza 2 made Yakuza 1 feel optional. The start of Yakuza 2 included a reminisce option during the scene at the graves, allowing a recap of Yakuza 1 without the fluff. Early dialogue and the few flashback scenes you were given allowed newcomers to piece together the gist of the last game's events. Even without them, the uncertainties of the past served as a core theme in Yakuza 2's narrative, making the limited information about what haunts Kiryu and his unwillingness to call himself the Dragon of Dojima in his scene with Ryuji all the more powerful. The first Yakuza was borderline nonsensical, with new characters showing up as sudden villains and more and more factions being revealed as the true puppeteers every other chapter. Yakuza 2 was an authentic crime drama. Motivations overlapped and allegiances would change when they began to clash, providing the tense environment and constantly raising stakes. The focal point of the narrative revolved around a single person, as killing him would end any hope of a truce, and it allowed him to be explored as a developing character. This was a story about Kiryu, and its other characters were stage actors representing his inner conflict. It's similar to how one might consider Batman characters. Joker, Alfred, Two-Face, Robin, all characters representing different parts of the hero's psyche. When Kiryu spoke, it was frequently used as an opportunity to directly present the state of his mind. There were some amazing scenes involving one-off characters that served as paradigms for Kiryu to observe his own dilemma, and some scenes were silent save for backing music and still beautifully portrayed Kiryu's emotions. Kiryu returns to Kamurocho under different contexts. He's become aware that his inner conflict is not one he can displace himself from. It is a direct issue with how he, the Dragon of Dojima, sees himself. As a result, Kamurocho becomes the backdrop to Kiryu's exploration for a new identity. And believe it or not, the most compelling evidence is in Yakuza 2's nightlife simulation. More interaction was added to the hostess bars in Yakuza 2. To complete each hostess's quest line, you now had to take them out on a few dates first. You picked a location and had to pay attention to what each woman was interested in to impress them. Just don't take them bowling unless you want to get schooled. See, what's up with that? Talking to them at the bars was an eye-opening experience. The hostesses tended to drop the act and become incredibly transparent about their work. Many of the women talked about perverts and other problematic clients, their own opinions about the business, and how stressful the work could be among other things. This clinical approach lended to creating an atmosphere where Kiryu was comfortable to sharing more about himself. Ironically, it was in a place built around a facade that you were able to learn more about Kiryu's interests and opinions. But the hosting act activities didn't end there, as Yakuza 2 also allowed Kiryu to become a host himself. This was the same as going to a hostess bar, but the roles were reversed. You had to make customers feel special to get them to spend more money. The champagne call, what the club will do if your customers order the most expensive drink, was hilarious and sounds like they held the microphone out at a host bar until one happened. <laughs> Yeah, I'd make that face too. But Kiryu wasn't about to stop his adventures into host clubs now that he'd gotten so far into the business. Why be a host when you could run the club instead? Yakuza 2 allowed you to manage a hostess club as well. You'd upgrade furniture and customize the layout of the club using the revenue collected by the hostesses. Hostesses all had morale levels you had to maintain either by assessing what kind of pep talk they needed, giving them gifts, or providing a cash bonus for working hard. Between the product placement, the in-depth hosting quests, and all the mini-games modeled after real locations, Yakuza 2 at times felt more like a simulation of the real world rather than a video game about Goro Majima's fancy new helmet. It's possible to view the increased number of activities Kiryu can participate in as a sign of his worsening identity crisis. He's trying out all these different things and coming into these new experiences. It's like he's trying to find what sticks. The hosting activities really pushed this idea, with Kiryu and the player both trying to find the best responses to these situations and learning what worked for them. In other words, Kiryu is flirting with the idea of being someone else. He's flirting with his desires. 
Kazuma and Sayama sitting on a roof. T-A-L-K Oh. Oh, Amidst their joint investigation, Kiryu and Sayama form a bond. On a night they have to recuperate from their ongoing investigation to find the Omi chairman, the two have a night out on the town. They get into shenanigans and do things Kiryu never expected he would be able to do. Have an honest to goodness date with someone. This is an awkward, clumsy step away from his worries, but it allows Kiryu to be a different person. It proves to him that he can be someone else. The respite from his woes is cut short, however, when they meet a survivor from the massacre who reaffirms Kiryu's guilt. This compels him to confess the truth of what happened 20 years ago, on the night of the massacre, the night Sayama's father was murdered. Their interview with the survivor is cut short by the Jingwan Mafia, the remnants of the Korean gang that the Tojo had killed off that night. After making their escape, Kiryu asks Sayama to get her revenge, to kill him so that he can pay for his crime. And then, Kiryu is given a truth that feels like a stab in the gut. He learns to accept that if there was something he was guilty of, his death wouldn't satisfy those affected. The revelation was a major turning point for Kiryu's state of mind, but our man was still pulling himself in every direction and lost on how to proceed. Thankfully, there was one person who knew how to set Kiryu back on the right path. Yakuza's narratives benefit from moments of downtime, which is what side quests would usually help with, but Yakuza 2 slipped a few digressions into its plot structure as a safety measure. As people prepared for the final encounter or data discs needed to be analyzed, Kiryu would have moments of rest. In in his case, these were opportunities to worry about something else, and it usually filled out a character or slightly added more subtext to Kiryu's journey. This included a little visit from Haruka, and by visit I mean kidnapping, and by from Haruka I mean of Haruka, and by little I mean secret giant golden Osaka castle inside normal not golden Osaka castle under the full moon. And if fighting samurai and shinobi in a castle filled with traps and mounting a full ass gatling gun isn't enough, you also go toe to toe with giant tigers, and for once, someone else is as astonished of the salmon shirt terminator as I am. <sighs> <laughs> yep. But in his weakened state, Kiryu is held back by Omi officer Sengoku's threats, and it's surprisingly Ryuji who gingerly <laughs> hands Haruka back over to Kiryu. <laughs> It's after this that Kiryu shows Haruka around Sotenbori, which is exactly what any good parent should do following a kidnapping, where she's scouted by a producer. The producer offers to take Haruka and train her to be an idol. He stresses that she'd be safe, and Kiryu begins to think about all the danger Haruka has been in because of him. After agreeing to the producer's request, they go outside to tell her, but Haruka gives Kiryu a reminder about who makes decisions for her instead. おじさんが守ってくれたから。どうしても私を置いていくって言うなら、一人でも会いに行くよ。カムロ町まで。おじさんに会いに。はるか。
Watching Ryuji use his tough, ruthless attitude in the defense of Haruka is a look into Kiryu's past. The dragon saves Haruka, a symbol of Kiryu's hope or purity, his core attribute of wanting to do the right thing. The dragon is what saved Kiryu's hope in Yakuza 1, and protects that hope again now in Yakuza 2. Kiryu begins to accept that a dragon is capable of more than violence, and without the dragon, he'd be dead. His later conversation with the producer ends with Kiryu conflicted over whether he's Haruka's savior or the reason for her endangerment. If you think about it, this is an extension of Kiryu's survivor's guilt. Is he a good person or just a bad person trying to pass for one? Haruka then tells Kiryu that no matter where he goes or for how long, she will find him and be with him. She reaffirms that the hope and desire to do the right thing is an integral part of Kiryu, and it will never not be. Even if he is the dragon, he's still Uncle Kaz. Haruka returns to the narrative, and so does Kiryu's resolve. Though his inner struggle continues, Haruka's words of wisdom give Kiryu an opportunity to forgive himself and become reacquainted with his sense of righteousness. It allows him to reclaim agency over his own mind, and in doing so, begin reclaiming his own identity. And his plan of action? <laughs> Fucking somebody up! Man, I love hurting people in this game. Improving that combat engine was where much of the development of Yakuza 2 was devoted. In an interview with Silicon Era, uh, associate producer Kevin Frayne said, Accounting for fights against multiple opponents was actually one of the most important things that were considered when improving the fighting engine for Yakuza 2. Look, I'm telling you, I looked everywhere for testimony, so we should all count ourselves lucky that associate producer at SEGA, Kevin Frayne, was happy to answer some questions. Everybody say thanks, Kevin! The specificity is important though. The first Yakuza was a blast to play so long as you weren't getting dogpiled by 6 to 10 strangers who didn't understand personal space. And that scenario was one of a few that players lacked options to deal with. Negoshi and his team identified why that was the case. A lack of transparency about controls, and a vital function missing from their fighting engine that made dealing with flanking enemies possible. Kiryu was given the ability to quickly turn direction in the middle of his combos to attack enemies encroaching behind him. This mitigated the frustrating frequency that you'd get ganged up on and kept players in better control over combat. Hit stun wasn't as bad anymore either, meaning you could trade a few more punches before being overpowered by multiple people or strong attacks. The clarity and amount of early game tutorials were both added to, and this gave players a more comprehensive understanding of their controls, including some mechanics that were in the first game but never explicitly stated. This extended into certain enemy designs, with gun users being fewer and far between, and their attacks being telegraphed more aggressively, giving players a bigger window to dodge them. With better knowledge and Kiryu's new flexibility, the clunky feeling of the original Yakuza's fighting was more or less gone. Important decision making was still the bread and butter of combat in Yakuza 2, but the bigger window for those decisions and the ability to change the mid-combo made for faster, more visceral fights, and scarier heat moves. <laughs> Heat moves make my butt cheeks clench and other things rise into my stomach. To complement their fighting engine, Nagoshi's team also threw in a ton of tweaks to heat moves and the heat system itself, most notably were heat depleting at a slower rate and grabs lasting a little longer to give players ample time to drag an enemy to a heat move spot, which were now highlighted in blue on the minimap. The amount of heat moves possible were increased, with many obtainable through side quest completion or watching... Uh -huh. yeah. instructional videos? This new selection included heat counters. If Kiryu was in heat, he could spend some of it to immediately perform a finisher on gunmen or reverse an incoming attack. The heat system was getting a little more interesting. Maintaining heat on Kiryu now had a defensive advantage on top of an offensive one, but the reactive nature of Yakuza challenged players to be more conscious of their placement and button presses. To avoid button mashing or countering an attack, they could have dodged to save heat. Because a Kiryu in heat was a tough one to beat. Yakuza 2 also introduced what I call the buddy system. Fighting alone in Yakuza 1 was an odd element of combat that stood out because of how often Kiryu would be accompanied by Date or some other character. In 2, Kiryu often found himself traveling with someone else, either during the main scenario or side missions, and this time the team was taking full advantage of it. 
In times where Kiryu was shadowed by another character, that person would join him in fights to create some kick-ass team-up heat moves. Players could even befriend certain shop vendors through side missions that would later toss Kiryu items so he could perform a preemptive heat move and reduce the number of opponents he'd have to deal with. The buddy system not only expedited fights that otherwise may have lasted longer than players would have liked, it was a clever tool for crowd control. It helped reduce the amount of aggro players would be subjected to, either by giving enemies another target to fight or giving players one less enemy to actively deal with. And when there was only one enemy to worry about, fights turned into kung fu action scenes. Yakuza 2's boss fights were incredible! Each one behaved as a set piece and stood out in different ways from the rest. Each boss utilized different fighting styles and had multiple phases where the method of fighting them changed, and for each opponent their own heat move that they could attempt on you, but with the added adrenaline rush of being able to dodge their string of attacks, build heat off it, and counter with a unique heat move of your own. It's clear given the fighting system that Kiryu was at a heightened state of aggression in Yakuza 2. He's increasingly brutal, more proactive in his recklessness, and quicker to come to blows. I mean, any heat move in Yakuza 2 would kill a real person with Kiryu behind the wheel. He's dead. Super dead. Not only is he dead, but the cause of death is an excellent gulf form. These new terrifying heat moves and Kiryu's ability to rage on against multiple opponents is a reflection of his state of being. He's become reckless and wild, looking for a fight where he can get it. It's a sadomasochistic series of actions that lead towards the belief that Kiryu has a death wish, which, as we've already figured out, he, he kinda does. Which is why, in a final attempt to save Kiryu from himself, Sayama intentionally misleads him. Kiryu's death wish was strongly paralleled by the Jingwon Mafia's mantra, failure means death, honor in death, penance in death. His biggest foe aside from Ryuji eventually becomes a mob that glorifies death, and seeking revenge for that massacre plans to set off numerous explosives across Kamurocho. It mostly fails thanks to what's left of the Tojo clan and one Goro Majima's expert intuition. <laughs> All that remains is one final bomb at the top of the Millennium Tower, the scene of Kiryu's trauma, and who else to guard it but Ryuji Goda. Resolute in confronting the dragon, Kiryu accepts a final request from Sayama to meet in the basement of Tokyo Police Headquarters, and it's obviously a trap. <laughs> Sayama reveals that her and Ryuji are siblings, explaining to Kiryu that she can't stand to lose either of them, and plans on attempting to reason with Ryuji. She also apologizes to Kiryu, as she realizes that the two of them can't be together. He storms off to go after her, but the important thing here is the reveal that Sayama and Ryuji are related, or in terms of our paradigm, two parts of a greater whole. With Kiryu's desires attempting to appeal to the better qualities of the dragon, this final confrontation is Kiryu's confrontation with himself and his hangups, a final attempt at unifying his fragmented identity and coming to terms with his guilt. Shenanigans occur, and Tarada was alive all along. He's also the head of the Jingwan Mafia, because reasons. The last of Kiryu's closest allies and symbol of his guilt, the very tragedy that pushes Kiryu into his existential crisis turns out to be a ruse. Kiryu's survivor's guilt is revealed to be undue, and it fittingly occurs after wrestling with it in the midst of unraveling his conflict of identity. And then Tarada gets murdered anyway, because that's what happens, I guess. His final moments are his parting words, and one last action that serves to leave Kiryu the answer to his questions. Because the rate of dying in Yakuza is directly proportional to how many lines of dialogue you have, Ryuji saves Kiryu's life from this dude, who I never mentioned, but that's okay because he's kind of irrelevant, and that's the point of the character. <laughs> And 
And finally, the for really real final showdown between Kiryu and Kiryu begins, and it needs to hurry up because this metaphor is falling apart on me. They trade blows, ending it all in a bad quick time event that if you fail, you're forced to start the whole ending sequence over. Why? That's so stupid. Kiryu wins, standing above Ryuji. He has conquered the dragon. He has conquered himself. In his final moments, as the bomb ticks down to zero, in the embrace of a new loved one after having lost so many, after confronting his guilt, his fears, and affirming who he is, Kiryu prepares himself for what comes next. Oh, of course he doesn't die. There's still like four games in the franchise. What's the matter with you? The clock counts down to zero and nothing happens because it isn't counting down to an explosion. It's counting down to Kiryu's enlightenment. In beating Ryuji, Kiryu defeats the dragon. This perspective of himself, he comes to both fear and respect. Emerging victorious against it, Kiryu redefines what a dragon is. In doing so, he redefines himself, discovering that a dragon is whatever it chooses to be. Kiryu is whoever he chooses to be. After Kiryu puts himself back together, what's left is the pain of being a survivor, of questioning if he is deserving of the life he somehow still possesses against all odds. Tarada's answer to Kiryu's question lies in that final act, removing the fuse from the Jinglon Mafia's final explosive. The last of Kiryu's closest friends, the ghost of his past, bestows upon him this answer. Yeah, you are. You are deserving of life. Protecting the ones you love or striking fear into the hearts of others, seeking revenge or searching for peace. How you live your life is up to you, regardless of your doubts, regardless of what has happened to you or who you were. You deserve to live. Live to be better. Live for those who can't. Live to define yourself. Live like a dragon. And I move for me. And then I uh, move for him. And then I move for me.